the Eurozone still, still contains the big player Germany is still in a world economic powerhouse by any standard, within or outside of the Euro, an export led economy, and it's still quite strong. France, yes, they have some challenges as well, but the second largest player and they're still, still, still doing quite well. And then even some of the countries that surround the, uh, the European Union, the Scandinavian countries, for example, are still doing quite well. Switzerland, of course, is banking situation, heavily dependent on what's going on within the Eurozone, and they would felt some impact from that, but they too are doing quite well. I, I, I say that to say that I think we need to give it some, some context and not simply say, uh, allow the, 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 the price of stock to get the better of it. As far as uh, tourism is concerned, we have still been very actively trying to get business from Europe. And as a matter of fact, 2011, we had uh, more European sales. We had a very, very long time. It is true. Some of them, many of them came from from, from outside of the European Union, it's like that we just started from, from Stockholm, Sweden, um, and we've had the, the Finns so on board. But, 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 but we, uh, we still think that there's a, a lot to be had from, from, in terms of business, from, from the Eurozone, and we continue to work, uh, work as safely in that regard. One of the main concerns, of course, uh, for us, would be what's happening across the channel because the Eurozone or the number one source market in the United Kingdom. And, and even though they are not part of the monetary union, they are still heavily impacted. And in fact, I, I got a little concerned when I heard the, the governor of the Bank of England, that's their central bank, General Government of the King, when he in essence told the British banks they need to recapitalize lobbying because they are way too dependent on the same European banks that they're saying that some casualties in the social that what goes on in Europe. Um, we hear that the UK financial system is levers to the extent of 7.3 trillion euros. And therefore, what happens within the Eurozone will definitely impact the UK in a significant way, and naturally it will impact us. So I think we we need to to be aware to be aware of that. But but I want to posit something uh, that is fairly significant of the, the whole scheme of things. And and that is, as I mentioned earlier, we need to give what's going on in Europe some, some global context. And and there is a, a a robust reality that North Atlantic countries are now coming to grips with. And that is the, the shift of economic power, the balance of power is shifting. It's shifting south of the equator, it's shifting east of Greenwich Mean. And what I simply am saying there, we hear about the BRIC countries, we hear about the Asian tigers, and they are taking over. Um, I can remember uh, years ago, I, I'm looking straight at, at Tennyson Beckles, he was, he was principal of the Academy of Politics. I think it was rebranded the Sir James Institute of Politics. Um, and uh, we were talking, and this was in the mid 90s, um, about you know 2020, and what was going to happen to Japan, what was going to happen to China, and Malaysia had their vision 2020 plan, and so on. Uh, Lee Kuan Yee in Singapore, and what they were planning for the 21st century. And we thought that, that was so far off. You know, 2020 is eight percentages from now. Um, so we are basically in the thick of it. And what we are hearing is that by the year 2020, for example, the global tourism will be dominated by Chinese. One out of every five of the world's tourists will be citizens of the People's Republic of China. That is a hundred million Chinese looking to purchase tourism services at some part of this planet. Now that is our major business. And so whereas we are seeing our traditional markets challenged from various things, I mean it was a prime in the US, it's the same European debt crisis and, and everything else. The, the, the emerging economies are, 
are expanding rapidly. And we even are hearing that it goes beyond tourism services. We, we, we are told that the, the engine of the world's economy, as a matter of fact, from in, in as soon as the year 2020, will in fact be in Asia, China, India, and and, and therefore, it's, it's, a, it's incumbent on us to, to recognize that. And I think that when we talk about the, the Eurozone crisis, we have to, to give it that context. The worst thing you can do is to apply a short-term remedy to a long-term problem. We have to start thinking and we have to approach the global economic environment in a manner that makes sense. And that, you know, will again indicate this government's decision to approach um, some of these emerging economies very, very differently. Um, you know, the, the international business sector is no longer just looking to Canada um, and the U.S. and so on uh, in terms of offering the services that the jurisdiction has, 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 uh, has to put up there. Jurisdiction Barbados, with the Chinese DPAs, with, with Panama, with Brazil, with uh, South Africa, other countries, because I think it's recognized that that, that is where the future is. Uh, and of course, as you know, in tourism, we, we started the flight to Brazil. Uh, and you heard the Minister of Finance in, in, in the last budget make the point that we are deliberately going out there and trying to do business with the emerging countries. And, and I think that we talk about the best way to to deal with the current situation in Europe is to give it some context and to understand the importance of looking further see. Uh, I think it fits right in with the philosophy of the Democratic Labour Party. I, I have to, you know, remind everyone here, most of you will be aware, on attending membership to the United Nations, at least some here on Harry Jason to be quote. Harry uh, Barrow, uh, right there, yes, when he was a lecture, the Marble Lecture in, in New York City. Um, that is when Harry Barrow uttered the famous words that have been etched in every DLC mind forever that we will be friends of all and satellites of none. And I simply say that that is exactly what we are doing when you hear Minister Hudson signing the tax exchange information agreement or no taxation agreements with non-traditional countries. When you hear that um, at tourism, we have been trying to get business from Brazil and Argentina, and we're talking to two operators in China, and we're investigating India because we realize that that is the future. The traditional relationships by themselves are not going to do it. Uh, let me take into that. That doesn't mean that we're going to shut down dealing with these countries because they will. Uh, Bounce back in most cases. In the case of Canada, they still seem to be doing relatively well, particularly Western Canada. So we, 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 we continue to, to do that. But I think we have to uh, realize really to uh, exactly what's happening in terms of uh, the, 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 the global the global shift of, of influence, of economic power. And it doesn't seem to be easy. I will, I will put in a little plug here for Minister Stephen Lashley as well, who has, who has indicated that the Pan-African Commission is, is also going to be expanding its sphere of influence and trying to get linkages going with, between the, the African continent and Barbados because it is uh, something that is not only nice to do, we're not only talking cultural languages here. If you collectively look at the sub Saharan Africa, the growth rate of those countries has been faster than that of China in the last 10 years. Uh, it's amazing what's happening in Ghana, of course, we can see uh, found oil. Kenya has a, a huge energy industry that is rapidly expanding. And then, when you, of course, when you get into South Africa, we all know the, the financial, financial sector is very strong there, mineral wealth, etc. So, there, there are opportunities that we have got to start with to look at. To look at seriously. I, I feel very strongly about it. 
and I, I place a, a, a great a deal of emphasis on getting that Brazil flag going. It was controversial. I took lashes for it, but I maintain it was the correct thing to do because my understanding of being in public life and in fact my understanding of the democratic part of philosophy is that we are not only here for those that are with us. It's not only to learn something to inform something and say something you have to think of. You've got to think of the infants, the preteens and the teens. You've got to think of the future as well. And it is clear that, you know, there will come a time when Barbados will have a daily flight to Brazil. I see that very strongly. And then we will have uh, linkages that are just as uh, strong as we see in North America with with, with, with good South America. We, we, of course, are looking at Central America as well in a, a different light. Minister Kelman and myself had a chance to go to lead a delegation to Panama and Costa Rica. And I mean, there are all sorts of opportunities there. And in the case of Panama, it is frankly unforgivable that the linkages are not strong for between Barbados and Panama. Given the role that Barbados played in developing Panama, people don't understand it, but close to 30,000 Barbados went there to build the canal, which still stands as the most amazing engineering effort ever undertaken. Nothing comes close to the, the, the Panama canal. You realize taking these huge vessels and lifting them over a hill in Central America from from the uh, from one ocean to the other, the Atlantic and the Pacific or vice versa. Absolutely amazing. And Barbadian labor contributed to that. And so we must know, you know, these people uh, uh, have, have many of them stayed on in Panama, their their children and their chosen children have, have, have gone on to, to prominence in Panama, very detective leaders. Um, the former Minister of Health in Panama, last name is Ali. Um, you know, we had a, in fact, a, a Minister of Tourism as well, who was also a salsa singer, ex-Minister of Tourism, Ruben, Ruben Bladez. But if you spell it out, it is really Ruben Blade. Uh, so, <laughs> we, 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 we have good, strong linkages, uh, people who have done extremely well, and uh, we have to, to leverage that. Um, Panama is, is, uh, has a per capita income that is, uh, that is one of the highest in Latin America. <laughs> the Panama City has a hub airport in terms of offering connections to other parts of Latin America. Uh, has a, a lot to offer. And that is why we're trying to get the, the, the air link going. It is not only the 3.5 million people that form the Panamanian market, but it is the connection next door to Panama for two million people in Colombia. Um, and then you go on to the other parts of Central America. I mentioned Costa Rica already. And, and, and even those northern countries in South America. And, and even the same Brazil. I mean, we hope to have so many Brazilians here that it's something like <laughs> connect on both and something going on. Well. I mean, but we have to start to think in those terms. And, um, and that is, to my mind, is the best way for us to do what? To look at it. I, 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 I want to still say, however, that we are not simply going to abandon our traditional markets. And if I could get straight to the crux of it and say Europe, Europe is still a big influential player. Europe still consumes a quarter of the exports of the U.S. So they are still significant players. And in fact, we I mentioned earlier that we, we, we did quite well in 2011. In fact, if you look at the numbers coming from, from Europe in 2011, uh, we had a, just over 40,000 Europeans that came here. Uh, that's the most we've had in a while. And it, it is good business, and there, there, there are several reasons for that. Europeans tend to stay longer, and so the spending is even greater. Americans, as you know, in the U.S., you don't get much vacation. You get two weeks a year, you're lucky. Uh, Europeans get, in some cases, six or eight weeks a year. And when they travel uh, long haul, they're going to look to stay ten days, two weeks, sometimes even longer than that. And 
therefore if we realize there are some challenges in the UK at the moment, the, the, the natural way to substitute some of that business to get to them will be, will be from Europe. And to that extent, we have been pleased with the performance of the two in our charter of Sweden, so that has been we sold out. Uh, we are already talking about next year now, where we will not only be signing out the stock on Sweden, but also the Helsinki Center. And doubling the capacity. We have already doubled the capacity out of Germany. There was one flight a week out of Frankfurt, Condor, but we now have two flights a week. And again, our numbers out of Germany jumped up by a significant percentage, in fact, 38%, 38.3%, uh, 2010 over 2011 over 2010. So that tells us that we are, we are in fact, seeing the movement. Um, and, uh, you know, we should not abandon Europe at all. I think that we can even do more business there. And the same way that we were able to move Canada from the low 50s to the mid 70s, no, when I took over in January 2008, and I remember when the, the very first day of the death of the media interviewed me, asked me what were some of my priorities. And the first one I mentioned was get Canada back up to respectable levels. There was a time when it was our number one source market in the late 70s and early 80s. And Canada dropped all the way down to our fourth largest source market. And just over 50,000 Canadians coming here. In 2010 and 2011, we have seen in excess of 70,000 Canadians coming here. So the strategy of this government has worked. And we are going to build on that. And I also believe that the, the arrivals over Europe, which as I say are still kind of uh, dwarfed by US and UK and so on, and, and even to some extent Canada, the improved situation in Canada, we can get those European numbers up as well. And it is good business to move because of spending. I am not too worried about the Eurozone situation. That will take care of itself. In fact, I welcome the news that he touched on it, but the private sector initiative to deal with the Greek debt situation has apparently gone down quite well, and there is some measure of confidence coming back towards sovereign debt. Italy um, has been able to, to, to sell, sell some of the bonds with, at realistic interest rates. Remember, at one point in time, they have gone all up in high teens, which is almost like what you say on the credit card. So uh, they, they really were having some, some, some significant difficulties uh, with, their, with their debt instruments. But of course, I understand that that's improving. And we welcome that news. And therefore, we, we give, it, give it some context. But we also recognize the larger point of the shift, as I say, south of the equator and east of Greenwich Mean. And that is what Barbados needed to do. I think that as far as tourism is concerned, we, 2011 was a good year. 572,000 arrivals. In terms of numbers, I appreciate the point that the spend is not where we would like it to be, but that is a sign of the kind. We cannot force people to spend either what they don't have or what they do not want to spend. And people are being cautious. Confidence is coming back and it's coming back slowly. In the meantime, it is good for us to know that the destination <coughs> is still very desirable. We can still bring people here and they're still willing to come and have a vacation experience. The other thing, of course, is that if your average spend per visitor is done, the more visitors you have, therefore, the more the overall spend would be. It is the best way to deal with the situation of, of, of reduced reduce spend. But, but, but I think it is, it is important and we should all feel good, not glow, but we should feel good with the fact that in 2011 we can attract the same level of visitorship as we did in 2007 and you know 2007 
we spent a lot of money to get $500,000. We spent a couple hundred million dollars on getting low and low. That was the World Cup year, you know. So all this money was splashed all over the place. Uh, because, of course, manna was supposed to fall from heaven. Uh, it didn't quite work out. But this Democratic Labour Party government is a very trying circumstance. And through bit of hard work and a measure of creativity. I'm putting together, yes, a program of events, but not nothing from the sky and unrealistic like what was done with respect to the World Cup.